Well, good morning. We'll go ahead and uh, get the hearing started. I would imagine we'll have a few people that show up in the next few minutes, but uh, I'd like to be as prompt as possible. 40 to 50 percent. That's the unemployment rate we continue to hear of among National Guard and Reserve units when they return to deployment from deployment. While some of those needing a job were fresh out of high school when they joined the Guard and had never held a job before deploying, such levels of unemployment have significant ramifications for not just the service member, but also for our national defense. Today, we will hear from the leaders of the Tennessee and California National Guard who will discuss the relative, the respective situations in their states. We will also hear from witnesses who d will describe their efforts to improve employment opportunities. I'm especially interested to see how the private sector can promote employment, and I'm delighted that we will hear of an unusual example from the CEO of Panther Racing about his efforts and his company's efforts to promote the National Guard. Before I yield to the ranking member, I ask unanimous consent to enter a March 12th article on veteran employment from Time Magazine in the hearing record. Hearing no objection, so ordered. This is a great article that has an interesting perspective on veteran unemployment situation in this country, and I encourage all members to take time to read the article. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member from California's first, excuse me, 41st Congressional District for any remarks he may have. Mr. Takano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I'd like to thank our witnesses for taking the time to testify and answer our questions and to particularly welcome Major Ty Shepard of the California National Guard this morning. Welcome, Major. 600,000 members of the National Guard and Reserve have been mobilized since the attacks on our country on September 11th. They have served with distinction to protect our interests here and overseas. While the unemployment numbers for the National Guard and Reserve veterans varies depending on who is doing the counting, it is clear that our reserve forces have an unemployment problem. As a result of the wars in, our, in Iraq and Afghanistan, our National Guard and Reserve forces have been called upon to play an active role in overseas operations. Both forces changed from strategic reserve forces to operational reserve forces. Guardsmen and reservists have spent more and more time in theater, often participating in multiple missions abroad. The increase in field rotations that led has led to many of these service members having an irregular employment record, making employers wary of hiring these heroes. With Martier Reserve Base, home to guard and reserve units located in my district, I am well aware of the vast contributions our reserve forces have made to our national defense, yet I can't I cannot help but feel that we are letting down these brave men and women. Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that the unemployment rate is higher for Guard and Reserve veterans than for active duty veterans. And the younger the Guard or Reserve veteran is, the more unlikely he or she will be able to find a job. These veterans need assistance with navigating the education, training, and job opportunities available to them so they can reintegrate better into society and lead more productive and fulfilling lives. We owe a great deal of gratitude to these veterans, and we should do everything we can to assist them. I'm pleased that this subcommittee is holding this hearing and focusing on our guardsmen and reservists who are too often overlooked. I hope this hearing will help us understand how these service members are performing in the job market and learn more about the initiatives that are helping veterans succeed. I look forward to the testimony and working with everyone uh, here on, on improving the employment situation for the reserve forces. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I uh, thank the ranking member. Our first panel is already seated at the table. With us today are Mr. Ronald G. Young, who is the Director of Family and Employer Program and Policy for the United States Department of Defense, Major General Terry M. Haston, Haston, excuse me, the Adjutant General of the Tennessee National Guard, and Major Ty Shepard, Director of the California National Guard's Employment Program. On behalf of the subcommittee, I thank each of you for your service. Welcome to each of you. And just a reminder that you, each of you will have five minutes to summarize your statement. Let's begin with Mr. Young. Chairman Floyd, uh, Ranking Member uh, Takano, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this invitation to uh, participate 
in this hearing to share what we in Reserve Affairs have been doing in support of the Reserve Component Service members, their families, and their employers. Uh, my full testimony has been submitted for the record. And in this oral statement, I'd like to highlight three major areas. First, I'm the Executive Director for Employer Support of the Garden Reserve, ESGR. And we have a network of 4,900 volunteers across the country, committees in every state uh, that work to educate employers and service members about their rights and responsibilities under the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. In FY12, ESGR engaged with over 161,000 employers in various activities and events. We, att we attained nearly 55,000 statements of support from those employers supporting their men and women that are employees and serve in the military and the Guard and Reserve. We educated nearly 500,000 of the service members themselves about their duties and responsibilities. The second area I'll cover is, is about the unemployment rate and the uh, reserve component. I testified here last uh, February, and I spoke to the uh, status of forces uh, survey that had just been reduced that talked about the overall general unemployment uh, in the Guard and Reserve. At that time, it stood at 13.1% uh, for the general population, and for our E1s and E4s, it stood at 23%. The most recent Status of Forces survey uh, went out to 113,000 Reserve Component members, had a 26% uh, response rate, and the figures we're seeing now are 11% across the board for the general population of the Guard and Reserve members. And for our junior enlisted, the rate has decreased from 23% down to 18. The trend line is clearly in the right direction. However, the job is not complete. And even at those numbers, it is well above what the Bureau of Labor Statistics recently reported for the veterans population across the country. Uh, I know clearly that there are reserve component units returning home with rates much higher, as you talked about, Mr. Chairman, in your opening statement. Since 2011, the National Defense Authorization Act, Congress mandated the Yellow Ribbon Reintegration Program, which I also am responsible for, to include employment assistance and employment information in, all, in the Yellow Ribbon Reintegration events when the service members return home. Uh, we very aggressively started to leverage the 4,900 volunteers in ESGR across the country that engage with employers every day to look for opportunities to help our Guard and Reserve members uh, get jobs. Uh, just over a year ago, I launched a program called Hero to Heart, H2H.jobs. Uh, that was a program that consolidated what the Army Reserve had been doing under the employer partnership of the Armed Forces into one program that would be applicable across all the seven SEALs, all the, all the reserve component. Since that time, we've had over 108,000 service members come to the website. It's, it's a it's a comprehensive career readiness type program. It's not just a web portal, a high touch or a high tech, but we have a high touch piece to it with the 4,900 volunteers and with some employment transition coordinators that I put in field in the field back in, uh, in uh, August. Through our contacts with ESGR, we've partnered with Lots of different uh, partners across the country. Uh, just to name a few, the Society of Human Resource Managers, uh, uh, ma many of our, our employers, let, let me just stick to my script here. The National Chamber of Commerce, we've did over, over 400. Uh, Hard our hero events with them. The 100,000 Jobs Mission Coalition, the Job Connection Education Program with the Guard, the Military Spouse Corporate Career Network, Panther Racing, who you're going to hear from Mr. Barnes, doing outstanding work. Sir, in conclusion, to answer the question asked up front, are we making progress? I think we are making some progress. We've seen a trend line in the right direction. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Young. Major General Haston. 
Before his ranking members to Kano and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to appear before you today on behalf of the 14,000 men and women serving in the Tennessee Army and Air National Guard. I'd like to begin by expressing my sincere appreciation for the outstanding support of this subcommittee. The Tennessee National Guard has employed more, or deployed more than 27,000 soldiers and airmen both at home and abroad since September the 11th, 2001. Although our deployments have decreased over the past year, we still have warriors returning to situations where they are unemployed or underemployed. For generations of men and women of the volunteer state have answered the call to this nation without hesitation or reservation. Most return home after defending this great nation and resume civilian uh, careers and lifestyles that they have left. They renew their relationships with family and friends and reintegrate into their civilian workplace. The pressing issue we're talking about today is concern for well-being of our soldiers and airmen who may be facing unemployment in the civilian sector. When I testified in front of this uh, committee in February of 2012, Tennessee reported about 20 to 25 percent unemployment, and our National Guard strength was either unemployed <clears throat> or underemployed, with about 3.5 percent of those identified as full-time students. One year later, that rate has dropped to 15 percent, and about 4 percent has been identified as full-time students. This compares to an 8.7 percent unemployment rate for Tennessee in 2012 to a current rate of 7.6 percent as a whole. We have committed to multiple programs and strategies to provide the very best opportunities in helping them gain employment. The Tennessee National Guard understands the value of collaborative efforts and knows the benefit of long-term employee. We support our programs and, uh, and are focused on providing careers, not just merely jobs, and we're working diligently to assist these patriots in finding that career. We continue to work with the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development, the Tennessee Department of Veterans Affairs, and our military department's ESGR, and reserve programs to conduct employment assistance workshops about once each month. These are three-day events providing one-on-one -on -one career uh, counseling to address issues such as writing effective resumes and how to make a positive impression during an interview. At the conclusion of each major uh, event, employers including Nissan, FedEx, Eastman Chemical, Hospital Corporations of America, AT&T, and a host of small businesses are available to interview prospective employees. Since 2010, 31 workshops have been conducted with 24 hiring events. Also in Tennessee, the military department is working in concert with the Department of Safety and our 108th General Assembly, and they have changed the regulation to allow our soldiers who are truck drivers to obtain their commercial driver's license with only just a written test and not having to demonstrate their driving skills, and this shortens the path to their civilian employment. In 2012, the National Guard uh, Bureau's Job Connection Education Program, JSIP, was introduced as a pilot program in Tennessee with a goal of 50 veterans hired uh, by the one-year mark. Today, only seven months later, the program has placed in community businesses 503 veterans and another 379 are in the pipeline uh, for opportunities. Also in October 2012, the Tennessee National Guard again joined with Tennessee Department of Labor and the Tennessee Department of Veterans Affairs and Dollar General Corporation to launch a program called Paychecks for Patriots. This landmark initiative brought together 90 major employers with immediate employment opportunities, um, assisting 2,400 military veterans and their spouses seeking employment. By December, more than 50 of the previously unemployed participants found work through this program. In adopting the National Guard Joining Community Forces Initiative, the Tennessee Army National Guard has coupled um, with community businesses and global corporations to create an inter-service family assistance committee with 19 federal and state and local organizations reaching out to help veterans and their families. In an uncertain time for our nation and our military, the consolidated efforts of these programs is the right path to ensure maximum benefit and opportunities for employment to assist our veterans. Also, a joining community initiatives, the National Guard Military and Family Readiness Program, and our J-9 works in concert with the Governor's Council on Veterans Affairs to support community partnerships. 
these programs assist employment opportunities and veterans through local organizations like Operation Stand Down, Humana Military, Centerstone Behavioral Health Groups, and educators like Lipsum College. Hopefully through these efforts, uh, the Tennessee National Guard is defeating the perceived stigma of hiring veterans that could hinder uh, their employment. We are working diligently to present our highly skilled service members to employers, offering them a motivated, disciplined, drug-free asset uh, with the training and potential for leadership uh, within their companies. These programs, along with the U.S. Department of Labor Education Workshops in support of Veterans Opportunities uh, to Work, the VAL Act, uh, our yellow ribbon hiring fires and our outstanding relationships with the Tennessee Department of Labor are all positive steps in, in reducing the number of unemployed guard members in Tennessee. The bottom line is that uh, through these collaborative efforts, these programs, we are seeing positive results now. We still have a long way to go and it's imperative that we are able to maintain and continue these programs that we're, because we believe that we're making a difference in the lives of our soldiers and airmen. Sir, I've said many times that these uh, National Guard soldiers and airmen are the best Tennessee has to offer. These men and women are willing to put their lives on hold and without hesitation and without reservation walk away from their families, communities, and their civilian occupation to defend and protect this great nation. We owe them no less than our very best efforts. To effectively combat this problem, we have had to know the enemy. We've had to look beyond the reported numbers that may in fact demonstrate a false positive. In our efforts to understand the magnitude of the problem, we consistently strive to determine an accurate number of Guard members who are actively seeking employment. To take it one step further, we also have to determine if their deployment actually caused them to be unemployed or were they unemployed before deployment in Tennessee. We continually encourage unit commanders and leadership to identify these individuals in order to assist them, however we can find possible. We must know that the true unemployment enemy is before us and what is before us before we can engage it. In Tennessee, we are working diligently to identify and successfully engage that enemy. Sir, thank you for allowing me to be here today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Haston. Major Shepard. Mr. Chairman, committee members, I'm honored to appear before you today representing more than 23,000 citizen soldiers, airmen, and civilians at the California Military Department. The citizen soldiers and airmen of the National Guard live and work in nearly every community in America and provide our country with a unique military force that stands ready to serve the states in the nation. I believe a program we design and implement in California called Work for Warriors can be part of the solution. The Work for Warriors program is the most effective job placement program of its kind. Made up of only six full-time personnel, this program places, on average, two California National Guardsmen into jobs every day. In less than a year, Work for Warriors has placed over 1,000 California National Guard Guardsmen into good jobs. Our Adjutant General views employment as a readiness issue. The California National Guard Command Team has learned that historically high unemployment and underemployment in our ranks was neg negatively affecting morale, training, accountability, soldier and family readiness, and good order and discipline. The Work for Warriors program was developed to solve these readiness problems. The program developed after a conversation with John Barnes, CEO of Panther Racing, and our Adjutant General, Major General Baldwin. It then began in earnest when the speaker, John Perez of the California Assembly, funded the pilot program April of last year with a one-time $500,000 grant. Work for Warriors uses a direct placement model rather than relying on a website or job fairs. By leveraging the chain of command, we manage soldiers and airmen through each phase of job placement. The list of partner companies currently at 92 continues to grow. We define a partner company as one that gives us a job opening with a streamlined process to hire a California National Guard member within a week or two, not just a company that clicks on the website or pledges support. Companies value Work for Warriors because they get a quality, motivated, disciplined employees that are well-trained and drug-free through a concise and efficient direct placement process that moves at the speed of business. Work for Warriors is remarkably cost effective and represents significant savings to the government when factoring in unemployment and compensation costs. Successful federal programs, successful veterans employment initiatives typically have a total cost of $10,000 per veteran placed. The Work for Warriors program is averaging $550 per cost per placement. The program is especially effective for units coming home from deployment. 
we found that many units returning from deployments have unemployment rates well over 50 percent. This high rate of unemployment had remained a problem because most federal programs that assist deployed reservists did not begin until 60, 90 days after service members have returned to California. To close this gap, my staff contacts units while they're still overseas and works with the unit leadership to develop a plan to immediately reintegrate unemployed soldiers and airmen into the civilian workforce. Once the unit is back in the United States, the Work for Warrior staff provides the unit with program information on federal, at, the, at their federal demobilization site, often located in another state, and begin setting up job interviews for the deployed service members. The results have been dramatic. Placing soldiers and airmen into jobs immediately upon their return from overseas allows, more, allows for a more successful reintegration and can reduce behavioral health problems, substance abuse, and domestic violence. The direct placement model that we've developed is transferable to other states that have high unemployment or underemployment in their National Guard or Reserve Forces. It's also scalable to the size of the problem and can be deactivated or reactivated as needed. Again, thank you for your interest in finding a solution to the difficult problem of reducing unemployment and underemployment in the Guard and Reserves. The California National Guard looks forward to working with the committee to be part of the solution and getting our soldiers and airmen and veterans back to work. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Um, and thank all three of you for your testimony. Again, thank you for uh, your service to our nation's veterans. I have a couple of questions I'd like to uh, start with. Uh, General Hasty, you have a uh, very unusual agricultural development unit in the Tennessee Guard. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about what they do? Yes, sir. The uh, agriculture development teams were put together um, by the um, former uh, Chief of National Guard Bureau, uh, General McKinley, and the former director of the Army National Guard, uh, Clyde Vaughn. And it was a uh, collaborative effort of uh, putting together about uh, 20 agricultural experts, um, uh, everything from beekeeping to animal husbandry to uh, row crop farming, and uh, to bring these folks together with a security element and send them into Afghanistan uh, to work with the agricultural um, uh, community there uh, to show them that there's something else besides growing poppies. And uh, we have uh, we were getting ready to deploy our fourth team, and that, that team has recently been off-ramped, and, and they are not going. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, General Haston and, and Major Shepard, a question for each of you all. What was the unemployment rate for the last several of your units when they arrived back at home? So it, it, uh, it depends on the type of unit that it is. Uh, in a lot of our combat arms units, the, uh, the employment, unemployment rate was somewhere uh, between 25 and 30 percent, and it was a little, a little bit lower in our combat service support companies. Um, and the, our combat arms uh, units seem to have some younger folks in it, um, and uh, some of these individuals uh, quite simply graduated high school, went to basic training, AIT, and then immediately deployed. So they had really never had a job before, and um, and so th they were not considered unemployed. But if you don't have a job, you're unemployed, and uh, we just we blended them right in with uh, with our other folks that we were uh, helping to get employment. Uh, for us, sir, uh, we started tracking that immediately uh, when the program started in March, and we targeted, because we have such a small team, units that had 75 soldiers or airmen or more. Every unit since March of last year, which is, I believe, eight units that we were tracking that had 75 soldiers or airmen or more, had over 50% unemployment. A lot of them um, were close to 60% unemployed coming back from theater, which was pretty shocking considering that uh, these soldiers and airmen going over there are very well trained, used to working long hours, um, and are trained with the cutting edge technology that a lot of the civilian workforce uses. Uh, thank you. Uh, General Haston, uh, it seems to me that you have developed um, employment programs either on your own or with the help of nonprofit and private groups. And so my question is this, uh, to what degree to the, did the state workforce employees or specifically the federal funded Disabled Veterans Outreach uh, Program Specialist or DVOPS and local veterans employment representatives uh, help with your programs? So, I mean, what, you know, you're, you're having to do a lot of this on your own. and but yet you've got, you know, we've got federal funds that are going, federal programs. Give us the relative uh, effectiveness of each of those. 
Sir, you know, the collab what we believe is, is, is there's strength in collaborative efforts. Um, a lot of our uh, airmen and our soldiers that were coming back just did, could not connect with these organizations. And so what we did was we formed up a, uh, a staff section in my staff called the J-9, which uh, covered, it was an umbrella uh, that covered everything from yellow ribbon to chaplain services to funeral honors to anything that consists of veteran. And so what they've done is they've gone out and partnered with these other organizations, these federally funded programs, which we had not connected with yet. Um, and miraculously, all of these other folks started coming out, like Dollar General Store and uh, and our, our Tennessee Labor Workforce discovered through just uh, a connection that I had made in a cabinet meeting that we were doing this. And um, they immediately uh, came on board, and these collaborative efforts just started snowballing, and um, and, and that's that's how we came up with our event. So we just bring everybody together uh, under under one organization. Um, and, and, the, and the more we do, the, the more people that want to join into it. Now, did the, uh, I guess, digging into the weeds a little bit, did the state workforce folks come to you, or did you have to go to them? Sir, it was kind of a, a meeting engagement, I guess. Uh, I was at a cabinet meeting one day, and then I was talking with our, with our uh, uh, workforce development uh, uh, commissioner, and they had heard about what we were doing, and they said, why don't you come by and see and, and it was just it just wound up just a happenstance and um, and then working also with our ESGR uh, they had a, a connection so when that trilogy tied together um, it, it, it just it just worked okay uh, thank you and I'd now like to recognize the ranking member for any questions that he may have thank you mr. chairman um, major Shepard uh, what was the unemployment rate of the Cal Guard when you began this effort and what is it now? Uh, when we began the effort, uh, before we began the effort in, in January, the Adjutant General did a sensing as far as uh, with the units and pulled out and it looked like we had about a little over 4,000 uh, California National Guard members that were, were unemployed of the 21,000 service members. Um, so that's when he came up with the mission statement as far as uh, for me to reduce unemployment by 25% in one year. Um, we've placed over 1,000 soldiers and airmen since. So uh, really taking hold as far as to, to address those issues and attack uh, those efforts. So you said 4,000 out of how many? Uh, uh, 21,000 service members. So roughly 20% uh, unemployment? Correct. And the unemployment rate now and it's expressed in terms of percentage? Um, it's right around uh, 13, right 13 to 14%. Uh, what we plan on doing is in June, the Adjutant General has uh, sent out a memo that's going to both service components, both Air and Army, and it's going to mandate that by service members, so each soldier and airman is going to register um, as far as if they're unemployed or not, and that's going to be reoccurring every six months. Um, so one, that will give us a, a larger pool of candidates to work with, um, even though we already have over 2,000. Um, and then we can also uh, address all those issues, and we'll know by city, by unit, exactly what the unemployment rate is, and then we'll re-pool those statistics every six months. Okay. And, and why, in your opinion, do you think the unemployment rate was so high in the Cal Guard? Uh, Looks, I mean, to, to, based on what we've seen, the high op tempo over the last 10 years, the operational tempo of the war on terror and all the deployments has definitely hit uh, the Guard and Reserves hard, um, especially in California. Uh, also, a number of the uh, members that are unemployed or young, just entering the workforce, uh, don't have a lot of experience. Um, and also just because of the business. Um, businesses need to be effective as far as with their time and who they hire and manage because the economy and businesses have been hit hard. So having that person that may potentially be gone uh, two or three times, a number of our service members have deployed um, two to three times out of it, um, doesn't make them as marketable um, as far as to them and is, you know, could potentially be a, be a detriment. Um, so all those factors uh, definitely uh, play in as far as uh, those causes. Would your program, the Warriors, uh, the Warriors Work for Warriors program, be more effective with additional funding? Um, definitely. Um, right now, uh, our case managers that are handling our applicants uh, are handling between 500 to 700 uh, service members. So again, we place about two people a day. Um, that's pretty aggressive. Um, we drill. We have uh, drills. We've got annual trainings that we do, so we're not necessarily full-time just doing this. Um, if we reduce that number down to like 200 uh, to 250, uh, maybe even less than that, we'd be much more efficient, efficient um, as far as placing folks and getting people into jobs.
so you have some metrics there. So what is the optimal uh, level of funding? Um, I would say, I mean, if we could get for our state, and it could be sized, like I said, depending on the size uh, of the state and the amount of service members, but um, if we could essentially double our funding, we would probably be four times as efe efficient as far as for placing folks, and even with businesses, taking on new businesses and working those job openings, because um, the good thing is, is businesses want to work fast. Um, they want uh, uh, somebody that's going to be responsive when they give us job openings, um, so we could take on more businesses and more job openings to start working. So both from the business side and the service member side, that increased funding would help. Well, great. Is there a place for federal funding, say through a pilot program? Uh would there, you know, would that, would that be helpful? Definitely, there's some models that have been used as far as um, taking federal funds um, and using that to, to hire folks. As far as like my members are, they're state active duty, um, and put those in those positions uh, to be able to place those service members. Um, and again, the cost of $550 a placement um, is pretty remarkable, especially when you consider um, those costs that we talked about as far as unemployment, um, those other subsidies that are that are used to help those service members. And you, and you say um, this unemployment is a readiness issue. Um, how will the loss of funding for this program affect the readiness? Um, well, if, if soldiers and airmen don't have a job, um, it's really tough to respond to a state disaster, um, even to get there. Um, there's some examples we placed in our, in our testimonies, folks that were uh, soldiers and airmen in the California National Guard that are literally homeless. Um, so having, obviously, employment increases the chances that they'll be able to respond to a state disaster or national disaster. And obviously, um, with the federal mission as far as deploying overseas, um, that's one of the first things they look at is to see if a soldier or airman is uh, capable of being deployed based on their family care plan. If they have uh, a solid family care plan, um, then you'll be able to, to be uh, a lot more able to go and deploy and serve the nation overseas as well. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, my time is about up. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kyle. Uh, does any member wish to question the witnesses? Mr. Runyon? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you all for your testimony and General Major. Thank you for your service. My first question is really for Mr. Young, and I think it's kind of a question it, it's dealing with labor s statistics in general. Do we count the people that just aren't looking for work in these statistics? Because I know at the national level we don't, and that statistic tends to get really skewed, and it's not representation of truly the unemployment out there a lot of the time. Uh, sir, I'm, you know, I'm DOD, so I'm not an expert in the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and uh, wh what they count, but uh, for the survey that we conduct, through the uh, defense manpower uh, data system. Uh, it is a self-reporting type of a survey, and the, the individual service member can identify whether they are attending school and not even lo looking for work, or they're attending school and looking for work, or they're flat unemployed, not in school. So it allows us to di differentiate as to who is really looking for work or uh, who is going to school and, and not even uh, seeking employment. Okay. So right. that, that's how we know that our percentage came from 13.1 down to 11. Well, I mean, the scary thing, I mean, um, generally labor statistics in general are a lot higher than the number you see every day. So that's kind of the, the thing I don't think the average American thinks about. And it's, it's just curious on how your statistics were compiled. But thanks for that response. Um, General, um, I know I, I do it myself. I have a lot of the veterans hiring fairs, and it happens all the time. Um, and we know, I, I know Major Major said, uh, you know, the, there's a lot. There are companies that are just happy to be on the list and aren't really active in it. What was the key component to get people motivated? Was it just your sheer brute force, if you will? <laughs> no, sir. There is um, there's lots of companies out there who are who have openings that just cannot make the connection. Um, and I'll give you one example. Um, there was a meeting held in West Tennessee uh, about the Tennessee Truckers Association. And there was a gentleman that stood up and said that his company had 80 tractor trailers that was sitting there with no drivers in them because he could not get you know, quality people to come in and do that. And it's just finding those opportunities um, and, and, and connecting the people. Um, Dollar General Store, um, who is headquartered in, uh, in Nashville, uh, has, um, has put to work thousands of veterans and their spouses um, just by 
uh, connecting through your know, service organizations um, uh, across the United States where they was not making the contact between uh, unemployment offices. So it's just looking at those opportunities. A, a lot of employers out there um, see guardsmen and veterans um, as, as a real asset because they have uh, 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 characteristics. Um, you know, we drug test our, our folks, so you're getting a drug-free employee um, by and large. Um, we ha they have good work habits. Um, and they quite honestly come to work presentable and so employers we have found just those little simple things like that uh, that these employers want to make careers rather than just give somebody a temporary job. No, but I, I, I mean I raise that question because I mean the hardest part I think is you have willing employers and you have people you, you have guardsmen and, and People looking for work, yes, sir. and that ultimately, and, and it's so sporadic in bringing those people together. And I mean, you bring up the thing about trucking, and I had many conversations on that on the Hill last year. I actually had a conversation with somebody in academia not too long ago, talking about even coming people coming off of active duty, not for, uh, across the board of how much we invest as a country in educating our service members and none of the experiences they've actually had in the classroom transfer over into academia and we need to figure that type of stuff out yes, too because ultimately it's an investment in our men and women and you're going to spend even more money to reinvest them to educate them in another way and it's just an issue I would like to raise and uh, I yield back chairman. Thank you Mr. Runyon. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, gentlemen. I um, appreciate your being here very much. I, I just wanted to ask you perhaps uh, the difference in the experience you're finding between men and women reservists. Uh, I represent Las Vegas, and some of the companies there are doing a good job of reaching out and trying to hire veterans. You've got Caesars Palace doing an enlisting heroes program, but that's at the back end. I uh, now understand better and appreciate from reading your testimony the problems at the front end, the reluctance to hire reservists uh, because now they are so often used and for such long times and are called back and that's certainly been the case of the brave uh, reserve units in Nevada and with gaming and construction which are two of our main businesses I can see why they might that might be a problem uh, I want you're from California not Nevada but I wonder if you see similar problems uh, that or you might have talked to people in Nevada and know that if that's happening or not and if there are differences in the kind of challenges men and women face it's uh, we actually just gave some jobs such uh, in Nevada we had a business call us up asking for some folks to come over um, in uh, Carson City and then um, over in Vegas and we referred them over to uh, to your uh, some folks over there in Nevada so we've got a great partnership with you um, but I think one of the biggest pieces that, that I realized um, and this has been documented in some recent Wall Street article uh, Wall Street Journal and, and New York Times articles is there are a bunch of businesses that are looking for veterans um, and and they just can't make that connection um, and basically how do I get a hold of somebody um, that's going to be able to decipher a resume because uh, military service members typically write resumes that are with military speak and that doesn't translate well into the civilian world so how do I you know read that resume how can we get that resume written better and then how do we connect uh, and I think that looking at our direct placement model as far as all business has to do is basically call us tell us what they're looking for what the pay range is and what the location is and that's it even you know in a, in a five bullet email or just a phone call to us and we'll go find that service member get them the resumes um, and connect with them um, and that's that's it businesses want to hire um, they like the attributes it's just a matter of how do I find that person um, and how do I connect with that person so it's, it's an interesting problem but the solutions is easy if you just create that conduit as far as that initial contact um, to link them up I appreciate that but doesn't really answer my question um, would you add to that could you well ma'am if, if you were specifically speaking um, between our female and our male soldiers, uh, we have not seen um, a, a significant difference. Um, I know that most recently um, the females in the combat units has, has been an issue. And quite surprisingly, in, in our units, uh, 
we have not had any difference. Um, my senior enlisted leader is sitting behind me here. He and I just flew in from uh, El Paso, Texas, where we were seeing uh, our 212th engineer company. Uh, they're getting ready to go uh, to Kuwait. Uh, they're, both their commander and their first sergeant are, are females. And I was uh, talking yesterday with the, uh, with the commander and I asked her, I said, do you have any problem uh, going back to work? Mm -hmm. And she's a school teacher. And this is her uh, second deployment. And um, she said, absolutely not. She said, I have been teaching school 18 years, and um, I will step you know, right back into this. Um, but our, uh, our unemployment workshops and uh, events that we've had, um, uh, there are some events that specifically looks out at females. Okay. But, um, but by and large, it's, a, it, it's balanced footing across the board. And we have not seen a, a significant difference. So, um, I would tell you that um, that uh, that that our female soldiers have not been you know, dis alienated or anything. And in fact, uh, uh, they've had some more opportunities uh, than than our male soldiers. Well, I didn't think they were having problems at your end. I was wondering if different industries or businesses or professions that traditionally hire men versus women or women versus men. Uh, cause different kinds of problems. Yes, ma'am. Just, just as I said, the unit that we're sending out are, are construction engineers, and uh, they were uh, the, the ladies was in fact a, a young lieutenant, female lieutenant, was uh, in charge of a construction project, which was a test project uh, for the unit uh, before they go into theater. And uh, I was extremely impressed with their capability, as was their evaluators. Thank you, Mr. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Titus. Mr. Coffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it seems that we've got, we're, we're transitioning right now uh, uh, to, uh, um, an, from an operational reserve uh, based on a very uh, heavy tempo uh, to a strategic reserve uh, where we're, because of the fact that we're drawing down, we're out of Afghanistan, we're out of Iraq and we're drawing down in Afghanistan uh, right now. So it seems, uh, uh, for instance, uh, when I went uh, on active duty uh, out of the out of retirement back to the Marine Corps in 2005, because they were that desperate, uh, because of the fact that in 2005 uh, there was a stop loss program for people, uh, you know, that were that had reached their EAS and were ready to leave the on active duty, uh, individuals who had left active duty, but I think under two years were being called back and sent to Iraq in the Marine Corps. Uh, reserve units were in uh, uh, a normal rotation cycle with their active duty counterparts uh, and the Marine Corps had reached out to retirees such as myself uh, with specific skill sets to see if we would come back and I, and I agreed to come back uh, and did a tour of duty uh, in Iraq and the Army uh, uh, National Guard and the Army Reserve uh, those units uh, were not only sent to Iraq uh, but were sent to Iraq for an extended period of time that was almost indeterminate uh, where they were doing 14, some of the units were, I think, doing 14, 15 months in Iraq, and that wasn't counting their workup time uh, before they went. So I think employment was very difficult uh, for them to return uh, back to uh, their, their private sector or even public sector jobs. Now that we are phasing down uh, out of that situation, uh, what are the, the tell me about the differences and challenges, because I think w the, the huge challenge was uh, these multiple deployments. Uh, now that that is phasing down, although you certainly did mention uh, a unit that was deploying out of the Tennessee um, National Guard to Kuwait, but now that it's phasing down, tell me about the difference in the challenges that we have now versus that we did when we had, uh, during the surge in Iraq, we, I believe, had 170,000 U.S. military forces uh, in Iraq and we had an additional, I think, 30,000 in Afghanistan. Uh, obviously, those numbers are, are down now, uh, being that we're out of Iraq and phasing down in Afghanistan. Tell me about the differences and challenges that we face in terms of the employment of our Guard and Reserve personnel. Um, 
the first thing is between operational and um, uh, and going back to a to a, 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 a sustained force. Um, I would say that we we never need to go back to the guard that we were in the in the 90s and, and 80s because um, as a country we put a tremendous investment into those men and women and the readiness levels. Um, we did have some issues, and I think we had some challenges across the, f the force. Um, as you mentioned, sir, um, we sent some units that uh, spent 22, 23 months counting their train up and the time that they went into theater. And we finally got the issue of uh, boots on the ground resolved. And we got a battle rhythm going um, in this nation between the active forces and the reserve forces um, uh, in about 2006, 2007, that, that was able to be sustained. Um, thank you for your service going, because I do know that uh, our services had to reach down and, and cherry pick certain skills and stuff of retirees and people that was in the uh, individual retired reserve and bring them back up. And, um, and that plugged some holes which we probably couldn't have otherwise, otherwise done. But our challenge is now is, is that our young men and women won't, uh, I'm, I'm speaking for Tennessee, want to mobilize and deploy. Um, I spoke with a young man day before yesterday um, when I was asking in this unit that was going to Kuwait um, how many um, multiple offenders, as I call them, that we had. One young man, this was his fifth, fifth deployment. And all of these are volunteered, and, um, and and part of it is about you know patriotism and volunteerism, and then there's a part of it that that is employment. They like they like doing that. Um, the part that concerns me is the fact is as these deployments scale down, um, I'm, I'm concerned, and we're already seeing a trend of young men and women leaving the National Guard. Um, because they're seeking employment elsewhere, and that may take them out of state uh, to another location. Now, whether they rejoin a guard in that state um, is to be seen. Um, but uh, our young men and women uh, in the National Guard and Reserve, uh, that's what they join for. That's what they raise their right hand for, uh, to deploy. So uh, to maintain the guard in the operational status, I think is going to be is, is is critical, and it's a challenge to uh, our senior leadership to make sure that we have that balance, um, and uh, and I think that as as long as we're doing operational events, uh, be it in Kosovo or be it uh, in Kuwait or Horn of Africa or, or wherever we're challenged, um, there 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 needs to be a balance, and we never need to go back to the force that we were. Um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, where it was, um, uh, where the Army would uh, would have a need and call on the Guard and Reserve, and then there was this tremendous train-up period. Sir, in 2005, uh, you would send a, a brigade combat team uh, into theater, and we were training them three to four months uh, prior to going, uh, prior to deploying. Uh, now, uh, it may be 40 to 45 days. And so we have shortened that. So that just goes to show that that, that the guard and reserve uh, is the best quality of, uh, of of soldiers and warriors uh, that we've ever had. Thank you, Mr. Yes, and Mr. Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, excuse me. I, I think a lot of the points that you made are, are right on target, and uh, perhaps part of the problem is the, the guard and the reserve have been too successful. Um, you know, the regular components, they, they want you guys and gals. The problem is, is that this is a new phenomenon, I believe, you know, the multiple deployments. That didn't happen for a long, long time. And um, I think um, on the other side, you know, people are going to be very, very leery about hiring somebody and training them when they know there is this uncertainty. So. Uh, you know, I know they can, uh, you know, whether they're discriminating, but it's almost below the radar. I think there is a, a certain discrimination against people because they're in that position. And I wonder if you have any suggestions on perhaps incentives for people to hire uh, individuals in terms of maybe tax breaks or something like that. Uh, because they, they are a valuable uh, commodity, and I think people realize that, but the uncertainty of uh, and this mindset of multiple deployments, which is ending, 
but it, it's kind of soured the job market, at least from my perspective. And I, I just uh, see if you had any suggestions. And the other question I had was uh, whether your stats included those people that uh, just said, well, I'm going to go back to school full time. And, uh, and, and I hope that's counted in that, because that would skew the unemployment uh, figures. Thank you. Yes, sir. The, the first question that you ask is that um, is about the predictability. And uh, what we have done um, uh, in the Army um, is that we have what is called a Army Force of Generation Cycle, or R4Gen. And it, can, it is predictable in a five-year cycle for reserve component units. So at the fifth year, um, the individual, if he's in, in a unit that's in its fifth year of training, uh, could possibly be deployed in that fifth year. That doesn't necessarily mean that he will. And then that unit rolls over back into year one again. So he would be it would be another five years before that unit, unless it was a you know a specified type of unit that there was a requirement to go. But uh, but that's the predictability that we're trying to give to, to give our soldiers and our airmen. The second thing is is you're right on target about the incentives. Um, I have felt that all along. If you're an employer. Uh, and you're employing a guardsman reserve, uh, having some type of uh, mandated or, or some type of codified incentive uh, tax break or whatever would uh, would would really be, uh, I believe, would be a plus. The third thing that that, that you mentioned about uh, soldiers just not wanting a job, uh, we have found that to be true. A young man comes back uh, from deployment who's a high school graduate, went to basic training, AIT, deployed for a year and comes back, they can get unemployment in Tennessee, 99 weeks. He gets his post 9-11 GI Bill, and then he's living at home with mom and dad. That's a pretty good deal. That's a real good deal. So uh, some of these young folks are taking advantage of that. Just a quick comment about the, uh, the educational. That was one of the uh, the enemies that we actually identified um, early on that we didn't think would be an enemy um, was the GI Bill as far as employment, just like General Hastings has stated um, in that soldiers would come back from deployment, you qualify for your line 11 GI Bill, um, and then they fear there's no jobs out there, I don't know what to do, I need to you know, make ends meet, so they utilize the GI Bill, which pays for your basic housing allowance and for subsistence as a way to essentially put a Band-Aid um, on them being unemployed. And that's one of the things that my team members have to attack aggressively at the demobilization site when you talk to soldiers and airmen is that hey you know save that you know for 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 real pur purpose for use for yourself or for your families there are jobs out there you know use that for the intended purpose versus using it as a band-aid um, to, to, to kind of counter the unemployment thank you mr. cook I have uh, one last question it's more of a curiosity question than anything and uh, you may or may not have any metrics on this and it's, uh, it may be a gut feel question but it, if you look at Let's let's assume you've got a high school student that's your control group in terms of what their employment opportunities are coming out. And then you take a young man or woman who's graduated from high school, gone into uh, the service, had a deployment, and then has come back and has decided not to use their post-9-11 benefits immediately. In other words, they want to go to become, uh, to, to find a job. Who is having better success at finding employment? Is it the person right out of high school or the person who has served and has just returned from service? Who is, what's your gut feel or your metrics, if you have any, on who is more um, immediately capable of being employed? General Young, do you have any feel for that? Sir, I do not. Okay. General Haston, any, any feel? No, sir. I think both uh, both of those groups have uh, have equal attributes, and um, you know, a young man ex uh, you know exercising their their 911 GI Bill, or whether they just decide to you know defer that, uh, give it to their children as we can do now, um, or a young man that's coming straight out of high school. I, I think it's a pretty balanced fight. Okay, Major Shepard, any feel for that? I, I can't speak specifically to that, but I would say again some of those those uh, detriments as far as unemployment that some of our service members look at as far as the GI Bill, and then even just collecting unemployment. Because we've talked to members that you've come back from the tournament, you can collect unemployment. Well, when I want to go get a job, right. that's ten dollars an hour. If I can make more than that in unemployment, you know, to try to counter that. So obviously that that skews that that analogy a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we call that on the budget committee the, the implicit, the high implicit tax rate of moving from uh, more of a uh, being a support. Uh, 
a supported person to an employed person. So I thank you for your testimony, um, General Young, General Haston, Major Shepard, thank you for your service. All of you in the uh, audience that have served or uh, have served, thank you for uh, your service to our country. We appreciate it. This panel is excused. And now we'd invite the next panel to come and be seated. Uh, to, with us today is Mr. Ted, De, excuse me, Mr. Ted Daywalt of VetJobs.com, Mr. John Barnes, the managing partner and CEO of Panther Racing, and Mr. Al Garver from the Enlisted Association of the National Guard of the United States. And uh, after you're seated, we'll start with Mr. Daywalt. Well, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we appreciate uh, what you do for our veterans. I'd like to start with the testimony of Mr. Daywalt. Chairman, members, and staff of the subcommittee, I'm very pleased the HVAC is again addressing the issue of National Guard and Reserve unemployment. The short answer to are we making progress is an emphatic no. While some state and National Guard groups have had good success, Nationally, the unemployment rate for the NGNR is rising. I predict it is going to continue to rise for a number of different reasons. California is doing a great job. Tennessee is, West Virginia. A lot of the other states are running into problems. Specifically to the Army National Guard, at the time the National Guard Bureau stopped producing the current employment index this past fall, the national unemployment rate for the Army National Guard was right at 21%. Three times the national veteran unemployment rate. I would estimate the, and that in the voluntary survey, that's an actual survey by bodies. I would estimate the unemployment rate has now risen to something between 28 and 30 percent. But since there's no longer an effort by DOD or NGB to track the rate nationally, we don't know for sure where it's at, but we do know it's high. I understand that bureaucracies do not like to confront uncomfortable information, but hiding it or denying it does not fix the problem. I find this behavior particularly strange since the NGNR now represents over 50 percent of our total fighting forces. At the Veteran Foreign War Sponsored Vet Jobs, we see over 20,000 veterans a day going through our site. We find that for the most part, those veterans who have totally separated from the military are able to find work. That is why the overall unemployment rate has always been lower than the national unemployment rate. That is not to say some transitioning military are not having problems in the stagnant economy. Many are. But if the veteran is active in the NGNR, they are having much greater problems finding work. I give examples in my written testimony, and I've covered this at length in previous testimonies. The call of policy implemented in 2007 was flawed, and it continues to be flawed. What planners at DOD still do not seem to understand is that an employer cannot run their companies with their most important asset, their human capital, is being taken away for 12 to 18 months at a time. I would imagine you have trouble running your staffs in your offices if they were gone for 12 and 24 months multiple times. The result has been that many employers will not now hire as a new employee an active member of the NGNR, and in fact now look for ways to remove active duty members from the National Guard and Reserve from their companies, to the point where some employers now are offering members of the Guard and Reserve who hit the 20 or 4 year mark very large bonuses to quit. Like it or not, the component members of the NGNR actually belong to the civilian employers who are loaning the NGNR members to DOD, not the other way around. This has placed a significant number of NGNR members in the tenuous position of trying to serve two masters at the same time. To be fair, in the recent wars, DOD was faced with the challenge of providing troops to fight the wars, but DOD did not, could not politically implement the draft, and Congress would not let DOD expand the size of the military. The result was DOD used the National Guard and Reserve as a backdoor draft. I would have probably done the same thing, except I think I would have been much more honest with the employers and the component members about what was going to happen and found ways to assist both parties, and I don't think I would have denied for five years that there was no problem. History has shown that every time America reduces its active forces, such as after World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam War, when the Clinton administration reduced the military in the 1990s, the use of the National Guard and Reserve went up. Now that the current administration has reduced active duty, 
So where the NGNR are larger than the active forces, I perceive the use of the NGNR is increasing again. In my written testimony, I've given, I've made suggestions to help alleviate the employment problems of the members of the NGNR. Having studied this issue for over 10 years, I found there is no silver bullet and it won't be cheap for anything that you try to do. My purpose here is to raise awareness of what could be done to help alleviate the employment problem for members of the NGNR until something can be done about the policy. A more balanced way to utilize NGNR needs to be found so that the component members can keep a continuum of employment. If one is not found, we will have relegated the members of the National Guard and Reserve to being third-class citizens expected to fight and defend America, die and be wounded, and return to a country whose DOD policies makes it next impossible for many of them to find meaningful employment and have a continuum of employment with their employer. This is not the fair, nor is it the right thing to do to those who defend our freedoms. This concludes my presentation, gentlemen. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Day Walton. I believe before Mr. Barnes uh, testifies that he'd like to show a short video from Panther Racing. Two thousand twelve was a landmark year for Panther Racing as it marked five years of partnership with the National Guard and second-year driver J.R. Hildebrand continued his upward swing in the IZOD IndyCar series. But with a rich history of championships and race victories, it was Panther Racing's off-track efforts that would ultimately make this season a breakthrough year for the team. A partnership with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Hiring Our Heroes initiative would help fuel Panther's efforts to tackle the unemployment issues facing the men and women of the National Guard. While on-track success captured the headlines, 2012 witnessed unprecedented growth by Panther in its partnerships with the National Guard and Tri-West Healthcare Alliance as they combined to confront the veteran unemployment crisis. With one million unemployed veterans in the U.S. today, 65,000 of which are in the National Guard and another one million troops set to return home over the next few years, there is a tsunami coming and action must be taken now. In response, Panther activated Operation Hire Our Guard. As part of this, Panther hosted local and regional business executives at each U.S. IndyCar event and conducted an emotional short program to help educate them on the perilous situation facing returning and demobilizing troops. Their call to action? Engage with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Hiring Our Heroes. The employer support of the Guard and Reserve the White House's Joining Forces Initiative, and other local military employment programs by participating in hiring fairs and understanding the benefits of hiring veterans. Each at-track program also honored a hometown hero, awarded to a soldier or airman from the host state who showed extraordinary bravery or had taken upon actions above and beyond the norm. These recipients demonstrate the exceptional nature of the National Guardsmen, and this award is a small token of Panther's gratitude for their service to our country. In addition, Panther was honored to be joined by multiple Medal of Honor recipients throughout the season, including five during the Indianapolis 500 weekend. Some of the most heroic men in our country's history told employers firsthand how these unemployed veterans would be an asset to any corporation. With a goal to take Operation Hire Our Guard beyond the IndyCar race markets and engage more National Guard units, Panther Racing partnered with TriWest Healthcare and ESGR to conduct boss lifts in regions that do not host IndyCar events. The Boss Lift program brought executives from different states via military transports, gave them rides in the IndyCar two-seater, and exposed them to the unique skill sets that troops bring to civilian employers. Through these Boss Lifts, Panther hosted key hiring decision makers from Kansas, Missouri, Colorado, Idaho, Oregon, Michigan, and New York. As a result of these season-long initiatives, over 1,000 employers with 8,800 available job opportunities actively participated in Panther's programs this year. 
many high-ranking National Guard and military officials, including Adjutant Generals and Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Sandy Winnefeld, also joined these backtrack efforts in Boston. In an effort to improve the health of frontline troops, Panther has shared technology from its race car with the Pentagon, Georgia Tech Research Institute, and the Rapid Equipping Force of the United States Army. And subsequently, 2012 witnessed the creation and full-scale deployment of IVES. This system accurately measures and can help diagnose traumatic brain injuries for troops on the front line. The program is already expanding exponentially in the field, has been tested in live enemy fire situations, and will save countless lives and millions of dollars in long-term health care costs. While the 2012 season was a landmark year for Panther on and off the racetrack, the fight continues. Hildebrand is slated to return to the number four car in 2013, and Panther is set to refine and expand its off-track effort with the continuation of Operation Hire Our Guard. We are just beginning. This is our mission. This is our focus. Thank you for being a part of it. Wow. Mr. Barnes, you're recognized for five minutes. Members of the community, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and discuss our partnership between the National Guard and Panther Racing in collaborative effort to address guard unemployment. I'm John Barnes, CEO of Panther Racing. I tell you, we are honored to follow the leadership provided by General Grass, Lieutenant General Ingram, and the 54 Adjutant Generals who share our passion in solving unemployment in National Guard soldiers. I'll never forget my experience in arriving at Brook Army Hospital in 2008, meeting a wounded warrior wearing a smiley t-shirt with the word Scott Burns. When I'm having a bad day, and I think of him. He never complained. In the silent way, his courage made a huge statement to me in my life. Life goes on. Don't complain. Finish the mission and get better. The privilege of visiting Brook and other hospitals and meeting our nation's heroes and seeing their courage and determination is unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. Long rehabilitations can be very lonely. Our support can give them hope. We assist with troop morale daily by providing thousands of National Guard soldiers and their families with a day at the races. Our infield training unit helps educate our soldiers regarding employment and other permanent issues rel relative to guard life. Years ago at a race in Kentucky, I learned from our hometown hero who had been in impact zones where several IED explosions about the prevalence of traumatic brain injury. He had been taken offline, but he shared stories about his comrades who had suffered TBI as well. I asked him what was the level of G-force impact from their blast. He, I was surprised to learn that they were not recorded. Racing deals with serious head injuries every day. We utilize data recorders and in-air accelerometers to measure the impact of a driver's accident, which is then used for treatment and development of better equipment. We, as the video said, we shared this with the Army. Now with modification and repurposes, we had over 4,000 of them been deployed. Today we're discussing designs of seats used in IndyCar that potentially could help helicopter pilots who have a high rate of spinal injuries. So why is this important? Because we see the many assets in Panther's toolbox as the Guard's assets. These synergies have provided us with a foundation to build a successful unemployment program. We form partnerships and said with ESGR, the Chamber of Commerce, each respective state's National Guard leadership and employment outreach coordinators. Our efforts entailed engaging local business leaders at races and in non-race uh, states where we experienced Panther Racing's higher guard. We raised $1.1 million in private capital last year to do that program. When business leaders have a bucket day will experience a Panther program, we know they are leaving the greater understanding of the guard. Those business leaders who will advocate policies and practices that support our veterans. A guardsman with a good job at, at a company that respects and supports their service is a National Guard and our nation will retain for a long time. <clears throat> so we are a Pied Piper of sorts, taking the most effective parts of many existing programs, combining them with our program to craft the perfect environment where employers are set shoulder to shoulder with National Guard soldiers to hear about their attributes and their value to communities, our state, and of course our nation. 
we have learned that this engagement is simple human psychology. In life, people do not gravitate to things they do not know. Decision makers, we meet highly respected military, but are si in, in, intimidated and in how to engage them. We use racing to promote guard unemployment and to build a bridge from the unknown to the known, and it really works. Now we must encourage others to do so. Panther would like to bring our program to the 15 largest sporting events in our country. By combining the star power of major sporting events with the emotional impact of our hometown hero stories and respect employers have for military leaders, they will, these will unique, effective forums of finding jobs and growing the base of guard-friendly employers. Picture a guard event at the Super Bowl with the Harbaugh brothers speaking to our guests about this issue. Imagine a fantasy camp where you can learn from notable stars and coaches in the morning and afternoon learn about the guards unemployment programs and how they can help them succeed. Finally, this issue goes much deeper than employment. We have learned how that lack of a job can adversely affect these soldiers in many ways. Unless <clears throat> we will not be successful for those who have served unless we ensure those who are affected by PTS also have their opportunity. Greater awareness, education, and training tailored to contest myths about PTS are needed in the mental health community. Medal of Honor recipients are taking a leading role in combating suicide and educating employers regarding PTS. Typically, if a company has a choice between two candidates, a soldier affected by PTS and an unaffected civilian, they normally choose the one less risk versus one with potentially more reward. Much more has to be done in this critical area. I'm very humbled and honored to be here today. We feel especially a special calling to ensure those who have served our country have the same opportunities for themselves and their families that they have fought for us to have. I invite each of you to visit us at Panther Racing, see what we do, and experience it. And please help us to discover new ways to take our private-public partnership can do more with it to honor our guardsmen and their spouses to find meaningful employment. Thank you for so much for this opportunity, and I welcome you with your questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. I suspect many of us will take you up on your offer. Mr. Garver, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Flores, Ranking Member Takano, <coughs> distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the 414,000 enlisted men and women of the National Guard and the 47,000 active members of Angus, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'd also like to thank this subcommittee for some landmark achievements, such as the recognition of the Title 32 service toward the post-9-11 GI Bill benefits and the development of the TRICARE Reserve Select Program. More than 140,000 guardsmen now qualify for those post-9-11 GI Bill benefits, which will surely translate into more stable and better paying jobs. And there are nearly 50,000 National Guard members, most with families, that are currently covered by TRICARE Reserve Select. Since 9-11, there have been more than four, or uh, four than 750,000 individual deployments of National Guard members, and more than 50% of those Guardsmen are now combat veterans, most with multiple deployments. These men and women are no longer the weekend warriors of yesteryear, but battle-tested citizen soldiers in an operational reserve, too many of whom are returning home to find their only option is the unemployment line. It's been estimated uh, by varying sources that 20 to 40% of returning National Guard soldiers are and airmen are unemployed. These numbers vary greatly from state to state, and we have no way to capture an accurate national number. There are many positive efforts underway to affect this elusive unemployment picture for National Guard members. ESGR, Employer in Support of the Guard and Reserve, is still a key player, and they are working directly with Angus to give our unemployed members the ability to link directly with their H2H database to have job listings in their area flow directly into their personal email. The U.S. Chamber has its Hire Our Heroes program, and many major companies are making commitments to hire veterans, such as Walmart's recent pledge to bring 100,000 veterans into the workforce, and just yesterday, UPS pledged to hire an additional 25,000 veterans. Progress is also being made to fast-tracking the certification of commercial driver's licenses for guardsmen who have already been trained to handle military big rigs. Southwest Truck Driver Training boasts a 92% placement rate for these troops and goes out of their way to ensure that these men and women are placed with military-friendly companies that understand the unique needs of Guardsmen and Reservists. If Congress and the commanders of our National Guard and Reserve are serious about tackling these unemployment problems, we need to look at all opportunities, including the vocational trades, where there are immediate job openings available. But I know you asked us here to offer additional solutions, and we have some specific primary proposals all convey verbally and several others in our written testimony. 
One proposal is to encourage small business owners who hire guardsmen or reservists to provide a stipend that pays for their TRICARE reserve select policy rather than their more expensive group policy. In doing so, the troop would be getting some of the best coverage available and the business owner could save anywhere from $3,000 to $10,000 or more per year per individual. This would become an immediate incentive to hire guardsmen and reservists. Best of all, troops are already entitled to purchase these policies, so no new program has to be developed or paid for by Congress or the states. Next, while the sequester has triggered the partial furloughs of 800,000 DOD civilians, there is one subgroup of those civilian employees that justifies an exemption, National Guard military technicians. Currently, there are 52,000 full-time military technicians wearing their U.S. Army and Air Force uniforms to work every day, representing more than half of the National Guard's full-time force. While they are slated to be furloughed along with other DOD civilian employees, their unique status should merit an exception. What makes them distinct is their title, military technicians. Their predecessors were known as civilian technicians, and it was Congress that decided they were more <laughs> military than civilian, authorized them to wear their military uniforms to work every day, and awarded them that title along with expect expectations of fill filling roles and responsibilities beyond that of their former duties. As we speak, 7,600 temporary military technicians are expected to be laid off as a result of this sequester, and the remaining 52,000 full-timers will be subject to the 20% furlough, effectively making them underemployed. The President, Congress, and the DOD all agreed to exempt uniformed personnel from the sequester to limit the impact on military readiness. We believe the impending furlough of National Guard military technicians violates that intent. We encourage you to support H.R. 1014, introduced by Congressman Stephen Palazzo, which would exempt these technicians from furlough. In closing, we truly believe the vast majority of employers want to hire veterans, and that is one of the reasons why the national unemployment rate for all veterans is approximately 7%, yet the National Guard unemployment rate is estimated to be at least double that number and in some places much higher than that. We believe many employers are more likely to hire the veteran who's already fulfilled their military obligations rather than a guardsman or reservist who may be called back to duty for 12 to 18 months in a 60-month period. To counter that, we must work with the private sector to incentivize and show small, medium, and large businesses that hiring these patriots is the best possible choice they can make for success of their company and our nation. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Garver. We're going to drill into the uh, points you made about the impact of sequestration on uh, the military technicians. It's something that I was not aware of, so thank you for that. I'll now begin the questioning. Uh, Mr. Barnes, um, in addition to your contract with the National Guard, uh, or let's, let's say excluding your contract with the National, uh, National Guard, how much money have you raised from the private sector to support your program to promote the National Guard? It was about a uh, million three or million four, I think, total. Um, year before that, it was a little bit less, but uh, we continue to work daily to um, to try to address that. That's outstanding, um, Mr. Daywall. Can you go into more detail uh, regarding your assertion of members of the Guard and Reserve being laid off before the 60-day uh, window that's covered by you, Sarah? And and do you have any data to to back that up? Yes, sir, we do. Uh, we brought this up five years ago right after the um, 2007 policy was put into place. Uh, I'll give you an example of one, which was uh, the Iowa National Guard. Uh, you go back to about day M-160 is when it was announced they were being called up. 750 people got laid off uh, down to about day 65, 70. Nobody got laid off after the day M-60. It's because by then they generally had their orders in hand. Another good example would have been the uh, 877th out of uh, Augusta, Georgia. We hooked them up with the uh, CNN reporters that did the program Vets Wanted. 140 of those people lost their job before they deployed. CNN went over to Afghanistan, interviewed them, and then came back and followed them for five months after they got back. It was a one-hour special. It was really powerful. At the end of five months, only eight people had gotten a job. And all of them said on film, it's because I'm in the National Guard. Everything goes great. Uh, this is a common problem. Uh, I know a lot of people tried to deny what's going on, but it does. You can talk to anybody out in the uh, ESGR or Elvers or DevOps. You know, people all over the country see this. Um, 
I gave another good example. When South Carolina guy was called up the third time, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we received about 20 phone calls from people that were in the South Carolina National Guard. They've been laid off, uh, and it just happened that on the past Thursday, it was announced their brigade was being called up. We've got lots of examples like that, sir. It's a reality. Uh, I know some people try to deny it, but and they have bureaucratic reasons for that. But I live in Rillsville. Every day we're getting phone calls in our offices from people that this is happening to. And it's really a defensive mechanism by industry because they can't run their companies when your employees are taken away for 12, 18, and 24 months. It, it's anybody in private business understands that, which is why you're, we're seeing another uh, defensive mechanism. I've got six examples. I'm trying to get it all documented so I can present it. But companies are now going to members of the National Guard and Reserve who are hitting their 20-year mark and offering them large bonuses to quit. Now, as a former CEO of large companies, this company here is not quite as large as what I used to have, but it's a good business decision. If I got a key employee who's been called away twice and has hurt the company a lot, paying out a $100,000 bonus, or in one case we're told it was a $300,000 bonus after taxes, that's good business sense because it hurts the company. And that's why a lot of the companies, I, I hear from a lot of CEOs that if they were given a cash stipend, much like the way that the uh, British government does it with their territorials, and when they call up a territorial, which is our, their equivalent to our National Guard, the government pays the company so that the company can hire a contractor to come in and do the work. I've, I've been in Australia. Several different countries around the world do that. And it's a good way to get the uh, civilian employers to uh, support it. But like I said, anything that you're looking at it's not going to be cheap. I know everybody wants a silver bullet that doesn't cost anything, but that doesn't exist. Thank you, Mr. Daywalt. Uh, Mr. Barnes, in your written statement, you said that you believe that Operation Hire Our Guard could be expanded to other sports and entertainment platforms. Have you been able to reach out to other sports groups, such as the NFL, considering Panther Racing's connections with the 49ers coach, Jim Harbaugh? And I think we, you kind of gave us an indication of that in the video, but can you expand on that? Yeah, actually, um, we have. And we're continuing to do that. Um, uh, we put together a coalition of sports partnerships last year, and uh, to address some different issues here. And and I think that's a you know, give me an example. Today, after we leave here, our driver and I are going to go to Walter Reed. Uh, and before us is Joe Montana. He's going to go through first. Now, who do you think is going to be more attention than we given? Us or Joe Montana? You know, so it's him. And and so we think that that is a it's it's proven to us. Um, that really has, you know, a, a lot of validity and a lot of growth that we can do there. We can get people there, get their attention, get them on board, get the star impact um, um, made, and, um, and and we can make a difference there. We have so far. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. And I've gone over my time limit, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Takano for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Daywalt, uh, I was interested in your term, uh, uh, the backdoor draft. Uh, you know, when I was, I was a little boy, I remember the National Guard being the place where people went to avoid uh, situations where they'd actually be called up. Um, but in this, our most recent engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan, it, it turned out that it was exactly a place that you would go to, to, to meet those engagements. Um, I, I'm curious that. Uh, we're looking at the reserves and the National Guard as a way to kind of be cost effective and and save money from having to employ active duty troops, but we've got to solve this problem. Um, I served on a board of trustees and every once in a while I would approve the leave of uh, logistics personnel uh, for the Air Force uh, at our nearby Air Force base and that was just one person out of our operation. But I know that our sheriff is now reluctant, I think, to hire uh, large number and uh, plenty of military uh, folks like to go into law enforcement, of course. But uh, he's reluctant because if a large number of his force is going to be called up any moment, uh, that leaves him with a with a with a staffing issue. So uh, uh, this is ra this, am I right in the, so this is a un rather unprecedented situation that we were we have with National Guards. Uh, 
um, and its relationship to uh, employers, both public and private. Yes, sir, it is an unprecedented situation. It goes back to when the Federal Reserve was created, the Army in 1908 and the Navy in 1915. At that time, there are a lot of articles written about who actually owns the asset. Is it the War Department back then, or is it the civilian employer? It was never legislated. And so it's for that 900-pound grill been sitting in the corner. And, but it also helps when you look at the unemployment problems to separate the guard from the reserve from those who transition off. Because when a federal reservist comes back, they go back to work, you don't have to worry about it until something else happens. A National Guard person comes back, and then you have an emergency in the state, who is it that gets called up? The National Guard. So they deploy to Afghanistan and Iraq or elsewhere around the world. Then when they come back and you have a, an emergency, they get called up again. And that is one of the reasons why a lot of employers are reluctant to take on someone from the National Guard, because they know, yeah, they may not get called up, but, you know, I'll give an example. In Georgia, uh, we had several brigades that came back, and then we had heavy flooding in Columbus and Macon, Georgia. And several companies were called up to help fight the flooding. And guess what? Two of those companies were people that had just come back from Afghanistan. So put yourself as an employer. Your, your employee's been gone for 18 months, and he's been back almost a month. He comes in, oh, by the way, I'm going to be gone for the next three weeks because of flooding down in Macon. Now, how do you react to that as an employer? And how do you react as an employer when DOD guaranteed you that you would not lose a member of the Guard or Reserve for more than one year and six? And then they get called up every other year. So that's why they're kind of a little reluctant to hire. It is unprecedented. And um, if you keep treating them like this, you know, you're going to create this subclass, why I call it a, a third class citizen. Are we thinking of this as a phase because of the particular situation we're in that's likely to pass, given that we're going to draw down in both these areas? Or are we, are we, to are we going to, can we anticipate seeing the same? No, sir. Um, it, 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 I like your term phase. Uh, because what's happening now, as I pointed out before, every time you draw down the active forces, you use the Guard and Reserve go up. You read about all these active Army brigades come back from Germany and South Korea. They're being replaced by National Guard and Reserve brigades because of treaty obligations. Uh, you take uh, AFRICOM. Uh, the bulk of the people over there are Guard and Reserve. In fact, one of my employees' husband was in the uh, Marine Corps Reserve, just came back from 18 months, been back three months, and they said, oh, we need your MOS at AFRICOM, over he goes. Uh, since we're drawing down even more troops, the use of the Guard and Reserve is going to go up. This problem is going to be exacerbated over, even more over the next couple of months or years. You're talking about years, but what about, how can we talk in terms of 10 years, 15 years, are we likely to see this stabilize downward? or? I, sir, I don't see it stabilizing unless you change the call-up policy or increase the size of the active duty because you will still have obligations, still things you have to do, and if you don't have the active duty to people to do it, you're going to grab your bodies from wherever you can, and under the current political situation, that's the National Guard and Reserve. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Cano. Mr. Kaufman? <laughs> Let me show you uh, for anybody in the panel. Uh, I just want to uh, point of clarification that on in current law, it, is, it, is it focused on reemployment rights for the Guard and Reserve as opposed to uh, what happens in terms of, of pre-deployment? In other words, uh, if I got your testimony right, that uh, maybe uh, a loophole in the current law is to say, um, okay, you're um, you're going to be mo I know you're going to be mobilized, so I'm going to go ahead and lay you off now. Uh, because uh, so the, to relieve myself of the responsibility as an employer for when you for having you gone and then having to reemploy you when you come back is that correct? Anybody? Yes, that is. Laws are are most heavily written to favor the returning member, and if they've found this escape clause to prevent that, it violates the intent, but not the law itself. So okay, he's correct. So how would you rewrite that then? We've looked at that several times. I brought them with the delegation from Georgia and something you need to understand. If you extended USERRA to when someone goes into the military reserve or the National Guard, nobody will ever hire them because they know that they're going to get called up. That's why I say you got a problem with your call-up policy and you need to ameliorate or at least re 
to compensate the employers for losing their if I came to you, sir, and said, okay, we're going to take away your entire staff for 18 months, how effective could you be here in the Congress? That actually happened with a company in Houston there where 22 of their CNC machinists were in the Houston Brigade when it got called up, and he went out of business. First of all, I don't want to answer that question without my, with my staff present. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could also use an example of Tattnall County down in Georgia sure. from when, the, when one of our brigades was right. called up. Everybody, all the jailers happened to be in the National Guard, and they had to shut down the jail. Well, I, I, you know, I think we have to prepare for a worst-case scenario that we're going to be back in the situation we've been in. I think now, um, I think um, the call-ups are less about units, more about individuals, sort of the IMA. Uh, individual of uh, uh, augmentee uh, IA or however you 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 classify it based on uh, the respective service. Uh, so it's it's still going to be an issue, but but I'm, I am concerned about that the 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 notion that um, and and I realize the downside if we tighten up the law would be would you hire these people? But I still think it's it is problematic to to have such a gaping loophole in the law uh, as to the intent to say. Well, I'm okay to lay you off, knowing prior to your receipt. I know you're going to be in receipt of orders, so I'm going to lay you off now, and that way I have no requirement to rehire you uh, under the law. Mr. Chairman, you're back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kaufman. I'd like to. Um, uh, does anyone have any other questions? I, I want to start with one question. We'll see if we can have another round of questions. If that's all right, uh, Mr. Garber. Uh, you gave a suggestion regarding TRICARE Reserve, um, and I think you're suggesting that, that employers pay the premium. Can you expand on that for me? I can. I can give a personal example with myself. I'm a, I'm a serving reservist in E9 in the Air Force Reserve, and we have a staff of eight. We're a small business, Angus is. And uh, we budget uh, $7,200 per employee just to cover their individual health care costs. My cost is $195 a month. And so as a benefit to Angus, um, I just simply purchased my own TRICARE Reserve Select and opt not to take that health care cost because it's a big uh, cost savings uh, to our organization. That's why I'm aware of this. Each state, however, has different requirements uh, based on their insurance commission of whether or not an employer can offer multiple insurance. If they, there are some states with some restrictions about uh, if you know if you buy a group policy, that's all you can buy. What we'd like to figure out if, if there's a way that employers can directly pay the Tricare Reserve Select uh, on an auto payment basis, so it relieves that pressure from the troop. Because we also have a lot of troops that if they miss a payment, they get kicked out of the system. And so, but I'm here to tell you, if you're paying 7,200 on an individual and you're paying as much as 15,000 on a family coverage, if you offer that. The savings could be significant, and it would it would be a benefit because again the system already exists, uh, so you don't have to create anything new other than somehow incentivize the small business to to utilize that. Thank you, Mr. Garber. I'll now recognize Mr. Takano for any final questions and closing comments. Just to follow up, just to follow up on that question, Mr. Chairman, are are you suggesting that somehow uh, we incentivize small businesses? Uh, by actually uh, covering the cost of that health insurance? No, not by the Congress covering the co or not by the United States covering the cost of that, the small business paying the premium. But it would be cheaper for them to pay the premium on TRICARE Reserve Select than what they currently offer. What they, so, so instead of instead of their group plan, they'd be able to pay the health care uh, for that service, ex-service member, uh, and, and that's generally a lower premium. Yes. It's only, uh, I believe, it's sixty dollars for an individual and one hundred and ninety-five dollars in change for a family. Oh uh, wow! So I, I have a wife and five children that are all covered for one hundred and ninety-five dollars a month. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cano. I'd like to uh, make one final observation regarding employment among those serving in the Guard and Reserves, uh, and for that matter, any veteran. Uh, we have heard today about the employment programs that are being run by state guard organizations, and I applaud you and them uh, for trying to take care of their people. That's what good leaders do. Uh, but I must ask a, a rhetorical question for now, and, and that question is this. Uh, with literally billions of dollars going to the Department of Labor, including $261 million requested for FY 2013 for Veterans Employment and Training Service, 
The question is why must guard units dedicate scarce resources to help their service members find a job? And we'll uh, we'll be digging into that as as uh, this subcommittee uh, proceeds with this business this year. In closing, I would like to thank each of you for your time here today. Uh, Mr. Daywalt, thank you for being here. Mr. Barnes, thank you. Thank you for your service to our veterans. And Mr. Garber, thank you as well. I want to uh, also wish Mr. Barnes a successful uh, uh, and safe IndyCar season and uh, victory in the, the uh, Indy 500 in May. Uh, finally, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include any extraneous material in the record of today's hearing. Hearing no objections, so ordered. We are adjourned. Thank you.